Um, I, the, the only thing that I am unhappy with with my job the past three and a half years as the Director of Research and Preservation is that I have a very long commute and I miss all of Ariel's fabulous programs that are incredible. And every month, you know, I'll find out the ones that are coming up and I'll be like, oh, I really get home and sleep. I'm exhausted. But um, it's really so fun when I get to actually participate in one. And um, for once, this is my baby. I mean, you know, the, the title is Director of Research and Preservation and Research is First. And if I could do that all the time, that's exactly what I do. And so this is definitely an area where I'm fairly comfortable. And researching the East Village has been so much fun and it continues to be so much fun. Um, so um, in case some of you aren't aware, um, we just launched the East Village Building Blocks. Our reasoning for this initially, um, over 10 years ago we launched this, um, was because so much of it was undocumented, so much of it wasn't landmarked. We have had landmarks since, um, the East Village uh, Lower East Side Historic District for one. Um, and um, so we felt that it really, it really needed to be documented and we thought it should be shared with the public. And it took us over 10 years to do, but nonetheless we did it. And so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through um, uh, some examples of how we did that research because this was not easy to do in a lot of cases. Um, believe it or not, New York City loses old documents sometimes. <laughs> Very often, um, and we have a lot of old structures here, whether we, you can still recognize them as old structures or not. Um, I am going to be giving you a lot of different resources, most of which are online, but do not worry. Um, we have your email addresses. Uh, for those of you maybe that weren't originally on the list, make sure we have your email address. And in the follow-up email on this program, I put together a list of all my goodies to help you guys do your own research. Um, all the online links are right there to take to these resources. Um, so, um, the, so when you first go to the Building Blocks webpage, you see this, and there's all kinds of features. Um, you can um, just initially put in your address up here to try and research, to, to bring up a building that you're interested in. We have different um, featured blocks or featured buildings. Um, but I think that the best way to sort of search for a building because, as you know, especially corner buildings have two different addresses. <coughs> sometimes you have several numbers associated with them. Sometimes those numbers change over time. So I like this the best, the, the block finder. And clicking on a block brings up all those buildings on that block. Um, so for instance, I brought up this block and I brought up the building you're in right now. And it has the, the most important information that we were initially gathering is building date, owner, original use, I'm sorry, original owner, and architect. The, and that's the sort of flag information, what I call sort of the top billing information right up there. And then down here goes into sometimes a description about the architecture um, in other history that might be associated with it. Um, and over in the side columns, you have links to the historic documentation that we found on it, whether it's tax records, whether it's um, permits, um, all those are over in here. You have links directly to those. You also have links to sometimes a, a blog outside of village preservation that might have been written. You also have links to our blog, which have been written. We have, I think, what was the last count we did on how many blogs we've done over the years since we launched it? Well over 2,000 blogs. And we had um, my research intern link every single blog that had to do with the East Village back to these buildings where appropriate. There were 900 East Village blogs at that time. <coughs> um, and that was just the last few weeks. So that information is there too. In this case, this structure, which was built in 1904 and designed by McKim Mead and White, the little architecture firm that you might have heard of, <laughs> that, this is both a New York City landmark and it's also within the East 10th Street Historic District. And so we have links to those designation reports as well. I'm going to go into designation reports a little bit more as this sort of wears on. So it, it really is a tremendous resource. Um, I will say that there's 
There's some buildings where, and you'll see this as I take you through the journey of researching some of these buildings, there's some buildings where we don't have a lot of information, although you try and try and try, um, but most of the buildings we, we, have, we have this information right up here. And one of the extraordinary things that's happened is, so I came in three and a half years ago, and I would say that since the three and a half years, because of resources which have become online since I've been here, there were an additional probably 150 buildings where we found information where we didn't have it before. Because permits were missing or whatever, but now, in, and you're gonna find out about this later, uh, because of the way the Real Estate Record and Builder's Guide, which again is a publication that I'll get into later, is now so searchable right, thanks to the Columbia University Library digital collection, we were able to find a lot more information. Um, so it's exciting. And, and these online resources keep opening up, and the, hard, the thing that you always have to check is that you're looking at the right stuff. Um, so, um, so the other thing that we have on here that we've just started, actually just go back to the main page for a second. You'll see right here we have guided tours. Um, so we're creating tours um, probably about once a week right now. Uh, this was one that was just launched, punk rock tour in the East Village, different sites associated with punk rock history. And um, other tours that we've created so far that we'll take you through. And um, right now also we're writing a blog that accompanies that tour and talks about the buildings a little bit. And, um, wait, go back. Um, hold on, I wanna get all these tours. So right now we have the punk rock tour you see here, individual landmarks, I just did that one, there were 30. Uh, CBJ Snyder Schools, uh, which is about to be launched. Oh, I gave it away. East Village Music Venues, the Squats of the East Village, Quine Deutschland, African American History, something called Places That Matter that Andrew came up with, and I don't know what that means. Um, and then historic, e but I bet it's fascinating. Um, <laughs> historic East 10th Street, which you're on, and the Jewish Rialto. And we'll, we're going to keep on adding these tours um, with these different themes. Um, so what accompanied this, uh, this survey, because a survey is, is only so good as someone coming together and bringing all that information together and bringing it in a narrative format, is this unbelievable 246-page report by Francis Maroney. And just to take you back for a moment, there is a link as you go further down on the right side to uh, Francis's report. So you can see it in digital format. Um, we're also selling copies of it right now. Um, I prefer the digital format myself because uh, for those of you that don't know, on a PDF format, you can do hit Control F, little drop down comes, type in a word, and you can find anything you want in that word. Um, so I, I much prefer that. But it's, it's a fabulous report. And the chapters that are covered are uh, history of East Village and its architecture. Um, he takes you through the different styles. You come out a real expert on the styles. He takes you through the different building types, row houses, tenements, institutional buildings, commercial and industrial buildings, houses of worship, buildings for art and artists, Snyder Public Schools, and public housing. Um, and this takes you, as far as the history, from the Dutch settlement in the 17th century all the way on through to the present. And I think one of the things he does here that's really great is he gives you an excellent history of especially housing type and, and styles. And the styles in the East Village date back to the earliest American style, the federal style. And, and the housing dates back to you know, our earliest housing with row houses. And it also goes to the tenements. I mean, you've got a wonderful cross-section of residential types here and in styles. And, um, and, and it echoes the, the development of housing history in New York City. Um, and he gives that all to you so that you really start to become an expert and you're going to be able to walk around the East Village and other places in New York City and identify different styles and different types and what they mean. I know I can do it now. Um, so when we're first starting to look at buildings, when we're, we're, when we're, at, the, we're at the very fair, um, we're at the beginning of the research process, um, the, the, the thing I always say to people who work with me is, you know, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. And if you research a building that's already been designated, you're reinventing the wheel because the research has always been, already been done quite extensively. So this shows, this is the New York City uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission map 
which identifies all of the landmark properties in the area. And the yellow indicates um, a, a district, pink indicates individual landmarks, blue indicates uh, interior landmarks, there's a fourth type of landmark called a scenic landmark, which we don't have in our area. Um, and when you click on one of these, um, it will, um, if, for instance, okay, if you click on a building within the East Village, Lower East Side Historic District, it will tell you the information about that specific building and then give you a link to the designation report. Um, if you click just on an individual landmark, for instance, a cemetery down here, takes you right to that individual designation report. And it gives you the basic information, like what I was trying to identify before with the East Village uh, building blocks, architect, build date, original owner. This is the kind of stuff that everyone in preservation, that's your first, you know, that's your building blocks, if you will. Um, so I looked at the building we're sitting in right now, and uh, several pages that you can flip through come in on the pop-up. Um, it identifies, again, building date, architect, um, original owner, style, uh, materials, and original use. Um, and then as you scroll through the pages, it takes you to both the individual, because this is both an individual landmark, and within the district, it takes you to both those designation reports. Um, another way to identify if your building is a landmark or not is to go through New York City GIS. And all these links are on that sheet, so you can click around and play with them. Um, the New York City GIS map does a lot more than just that, than show in, uh, landmarks. And here they do it by doing an outline in blue, and this little blue flag indicates a individual landmark, um, and the red is an interior landmark. Um, and it also, it, it also goes into tremendous information. You can put different filters on it so that you can see schools, so you can see uh, zoning, you can see, you know, water. I mean, really exciting things. Um, the one place where it does fail, however, um, and I did an example down here by clicking on St. Mark's Church, is for some reason, and we don't know why, they have the wrong building dates on almost all buildings built before World War I. So I've already gotten phone calls from people who have looked at building blocks and said, you're wrong. My building was built in 1924. My landlord says so. And I said, I bet you're wrong. <laughs> um, and the reason why is they were relying on what New York City publishes. And I think it's so ironic because, so for the, for, you know, we all know 1799 this was built, right? And here it says, 1900. And this is their go-to. They say 1900 for so many buildings that were built before World War I. I know. I don't get it. Uh, I've actually published a blog about it. We put, we've asked the city to try and amend this because it really does cause a lot of problems. I mean, people really don't believe me when I say real estate agents, um, owners, that this is a much older building. They weren't building it like that in that, at, in that time. You know, um, they simply did not have steel. <laughs> um, and you know, I have had people who just were like, "Are you sure?" Um, Twenty years down the tube. Um, so that's the only place where this fails. But you all know, and you'll spread it among your friends that that's not the way to go. Um, so, uh, so that's the big, that's the first thing. So when we look at a building, is it a, is it designated? Because then we have all the information we could possibly need. FYI, older designation reports, for instance, the St. Mark's Historic District, which is designated in 1969, are not nearly as complete as the ones you see today. The ones you see today, they break it down building by building. They show permits. They show ownership. Uh, in the case of the Anzaport Market, they show all the commercial enterprises that were ever in a building, which is a painful research process. Mm -hmm. There is no one source in that. Um, and so, uh, but the ones that are earlier, for instance, I'm muddling through the Greenwich Village Historic District Designation Report, which was an extraordinary feat at the time. Um, but um, on top of the fact that they would just sort of deal, they really were only interested in the early 19th century buildings. They sometimes touch on the 20th century buildings as significant. But there was also a prejudice involved when they were writing this, and it was sort of like, this building really isn't worth much at all, you know? <laughs> um, so there was a, it was a different approach to the designation report. But you can find out a lot more, again, from ones that were done later. Uh, so when we're first dealing with these buildings, the one thing that was done for all the buildings in our area, minus the ones that were designated, was we 
went down to the municipal archives and we asked for the block and lot folder of every single property, again, minus the um, designated properties. Um, and what that has is any permits that are still in existence for these buildings. And it's very hit or miss. Sometimes you get, you know, you get a new building permit from 1870 and, you know, the doves sing and it's all good. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's other times where you get nothing in them. Um, but it, it all had to be done. And every single permit we found, again, is scanned in, on, in, on, in on building blocks. Um, and one thing I always caution people, too, is sometimes building permits were filed, just like today, and not followed through on. So you always, there's a whole bunch of factors you have to look at beyond just the permits. Um, but every single one was done for this. So here's an example of one where it was a hit. So this is 171 First Avenue, and um, it's a cast iron building, and uh, you know it looks sort of uh, late night, uh, or sort of uh, Civil War, a uh, 19th century. Um, we, we we found the uh, original building permit, uh, the new building permit. Uh, hold on, let me get the year. Uh, which was from 18, I can't read here, I can write it down. 1870, I think. Um, and this gives us also the information of the architect and the owner. Uh, the carpenter is here too, the mason. It tells us what the purpose was of it, how many floors, how it's going to be built, $18,000. Um, and um, so this was one where it's a slam dunk. We have all that top information. Um, and we could create our web page, our web page right here, um, and we were able to put in the um, permits right there. Um, I'll get into this later, but we were, we also tagged the 1980s tax photos originally in there, um, and we wrote a little bit about the description of the building. Um, so, so to be, uh, so to back up just a little bit. Um, New York City did not start requiring people to file permits until 1866. So, how do we find out about buildings built prior to 1866? Uh, well, the first place we start is the 1853 Paris map. New York Public Library has on their website um, a, an incredible collection of atlases of New York City. Um, a lot of these maps were for insurance purposes, so they needed to be documented correctly. What was a wood frame building? What was the use of the building? All that is done through color coding and dots. These, these early maps were originally hand painted. They're really quite extraordinary when you see them. Um, and uh, as an aside, they were also very expensive to make as a result. Um, when updates happened, uh, sometimes what they would do in order to save people money is they would send out little pieces of the buildings that had changed that you could then glue into your book. Um, and um, uh, they would also give you a frontispiece that would say, you know, update 1862. So for instance, the 1857 atlas, uh, which is, you know, a lot like the 1853 one, um, just that happened, where in 1862 the updates were sent, and so these little pieces of paper were sent to the, I picture the poor person who has to sit there and figure out what it, where each one is. Um, and, um, and so this is part of the East Village. This is from Avenue B to D, 2nd Street to 6th Street. And I think one of the things that's striking is by 1853, look at how many lots are filled. Yeah. And what is most, what do you think most of those buildings are? Row houses. Row houses or early, early, early ten tenements, right? But built, to, but built to sort of look like row houses, exactly. Um, pink is indicating masonry, um, and uh, yellow is indicating wood frame. Um, as of 1849, you could not build wood frame below 32nd Street. Um, 1816, you couldn't build below Canal Street wood frame, and they just sort of kept moving up the island. By 1882, uh, it was banned south of 155th Street. Um, so you see some, uh, some remnants of yellow uh, wood frame right there. Um, but you see a lot of masonry row houses that are, again, super early tenements, um, which I think is incredible how quickly this got built. 
Um, here's another area we're right there uh, in our area, actually, where we are right now. There's Compton Square. This is um, this is Sixth Street to Thirteenth Street and C to A. Um, and over as you get over to C, you start to see more of the green. The green indicates different kinds of manufacturing shops. It can also indicate private stables. Um, so, you know, uh, one of the things that someone said to me was, well, every single row house in the East Village had a staple behind it. No. <laughs> um, and ha and I, I remember someone saying that to me, and I thought, how would you get the horses in and out? <laughs> uh, although some do have horse walks. I have seen horse walks every once in a while. But then you'll see um, a private stable, a private livery stable, and it is indicated in green. Um, so, uh, um, so it's this is this is I, for me. Maps are one of my favorite things in the whole wide world, and I can waste all kinds of time rather than do my work pouring over them. Um, but just to give you an indication, and what's extraordinary also is East Village, um, and they're not alone. There's a, there's sort of a um, you know they don't waste anything. So you'll see a building that was built before 1853, and in one way or another, it made it to today. And it's extraordinary to me how many structures do that. Um, OK, so we're researching a row house now. So because I read Francis Baroni's report, um, I can look at this and know that um, this looks to me like a Greek revival, definitely a row house. Um, I know that this is a mansard roof. Mansard roofs came into fashion with the French Second Empire, which gained popularity around 1870. A mansard roof would not have been built during the time where Greek Revival was popular in the 1840s. So most likely this is an addition. And this is the kind of thing that you gather as you start to go through things um, through time. So now it's time to figure out, OK, so when was this built, Big Shot? I mean, let's try and figure this out. So we look at the 1853 map. Um, one thing to also remember, street names and street numbers change <coughs> over time. Here we're lucky. It's still 271. So back here, which is 271 East 7th Street, it was 271 back then. That's, that's actually rare. Um, and here's a backup picture of this area right around Avenue D. You see a whole manufacturing thing going on here, clearly. It was probably servicing the dry dock, part of our East Village history. Um, and oh. Anybody know what these are back here? They're yellow. They're tea porches. The Greek, the Greek Revival um, style, and actually you can see Italian as well, frequently had these rear wooden porches that were actually quite beautiful, called tea porches. Um, and, and so we see that here at 271 East 7th Street. Um, so we bring up, so we, this, so we go back to the municipal archives, and this is back to another physical trip. This is not something you can do online. And we bring up the old property tax records. And first of all, you need to get on your 19th century handwriting glasses on, um, which is very challenging for my Gen Z friends who are coming through right now. Um, my children barely talk script. Um, and you can see, so uh, the, the, um, the tax records are divided up by grouping of year and by ward. OK, so this is the 11th ward, OK? And so you might see a grouping on microfilm, yes, um, say uh, 1852 to 1863. Okay, so that, that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at that. And then you have to get to your street. So you're scrolling through that microfilm, you get the woo heading thing, heading thing going. And what we found is um, North, so North, I'm sorry, 7th Street, North Side, Cross Avenue D. And I look down and it says Cross Avenue C. So now I know this guy who was handwriting this back in um, 1870, right? This is the, um, the oh, no, 1842. 1842 record, there's an 1871 coming. Um, so back in 1842, when he's walking down the street, he's on the north side, he's going from D to C. So I'm able to count the blocks and back up to this map and count the blocks, so I'm able to count from D one, two, three, four, five, six. Six lots, OK? And I can count the lots. One, two, this is crossed out. I know you can't see that, but you can see over here there's no values. So one, hashtag marks are underneath here. Two, three, 
four, hashtag marks underneath here, five, six. So here is lot 52. The other way we can figure this out, um, as tax records were changing over the years, they'd add more information, like street numbers, what a great idea. They'd add in stories high, they'd add in, you know, but the early ones, the, the, it's very cryptic. But one thing they did do was they had these ward numbers, and it's not the big wards like you think of, but it's, it says right up here, this is these ward map farm numbers, okay? And these go down right here. And the one that's associated with the one that we think we've identified as lot 52 is 2213, right there. <coughs> well, we, we found out, and other people have too, this is a genius, and the 1891 Bromley map, for some reason, they put in these, these farm map ward numbers. Um, and 2213 is right here, this is 2214, 2211, 2211, 2212, 2213. This says 469, 471. So this also verifies that we're looking at the correct property. And no, this is not easy. Um, and, and sometimes they're not nearly this legible. Um, so this is the 1842 tax record, and this takes us to 1843. And here's what's happened. 1842, it says LV, that means lot vacant. And there's hash marks underneath all the way to our lot 52 right here. So that means lot is vacant. We also see that the value is $600. Go to 1843. Now we're at lot 52. This person has terrible handwriting. I kept thinking that was a three mm. to two. And here we are. Um, by the way, street numbers have been added, but their street numbers are different. <laughs> Here's 22, ward number 2213, like we were looking at before. Now it says lot and house. Hashtag marks go down to what are uh, lot 52 right there. And our, our value has increased from 600 to 2300 dollars. So that to us indicates it's a really strong possibility that what we're looking at is the time that this house was built. And we know the original owner, which is great. Um, finding an architect from this time is extremely difficult. And they usually weren't architects. They usually were just builders who were using manuals, who were copying off the neighbors, or, or, or had you know specialized in being able to do a certain style and just keep carrying it through. It wasn't trying to outdo the Joneses back then. It was trying to look like the Joneses. Um, just for giggles, I thought I would show you back with this 1853. These, um, the key is at the front. So you can start to identify what kind of buildings you're looking at. This is very, very faded. It's a little bit better on the um, NYPL website. These buildings right here are blue. These are all pink. This is yellow. Everything in here is green. And then this is gray shaded. And you can see the, the different manufacturers and things like that here. And I told you private stables are also indicated in green right here. This is for brick and this is for frame. Um, so here is our next mystery, um, and this was a real mystery. Um, I actually, when I found it, uh, I was going, I went through everything, I started going through it when I got hired three years ago, um, and there were some mysteries, and again, because the Real Estate Record and Builder's Guide, which I'll go into, became so accessible, I was able to solve a lot of mysteries, and this was one of them. So this looks like a pretty nondescript house, uh, building rather, and, um, now, I'm not really sure what's going on there. I can't definitively say that it was an old tenement, although certainly it has the fenestration and the height for it. Um, but I can't tell for sure. And there were no permits on file, which again is not, uh, is, I wish that was more unusual. Um, I looked at it on a current day map, and the footprint is telling me nothing that I see on that current day map. So then I looked at some old maps. And on the 1891 map, I found the property looking like this. And here are the three neighbors to the right. Um, you know, a, a masonry structure right here, a uh, rear building. This isn't looking anything like what I saw in the present day map. 1897, six years later, and I see a five-story structure here, and it's repeated all the way down. And this appears to be um, just knowing the history of the area and knowing that tenements typically came in five stories at that time, that it looks like forced tenements were built at that time. The problem with that is, is and the Bromley map is not as good with exact footprints, is that tenements weren't allowed to be built without um, air shafts between, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of tenements, 1879 until 1901, when the new law was put in. What do we usually see when it's a tenement? It's the dumbbell shape. Mm -hmm. So I do know from experience that the Sanborn maps, on the other hand, which were published in different years, were very exact with their footprints. 
And sure enough, we see the four buildings down here, and they're in the dumbbell shape. And so it's, it's, this looks like four tenements that were built um, between 1891 and 1897. Um, so then I went and I looked at the 1940 tax photo, and I'm going to go into all that soon because it's very exciting that that's online. <laughs> and um, we have four tenements right in a row. This is the one that we're looking at uh, for 244, and you can see the other three right next to it. Uh, so then I brought up um, Google aerial views, and look, see the dent that's not indicated on the New York City GIS map? This tells me that we're looking at the same building. Also, it is really unlikely for anybody to tear down a building and build exactly the same and make it look like crap to it. <laughs> it just, it's, it's not out of the realm of possibility but it just doesn't make sense. And for them to have this little dent that was required, you know, between 1879 and 1901, yeah. Um, so, so now I have a lot of information here. I'm th I think I got my range of gears thanks to the maps. So then what I did was um, I turned to the Real Estate Record and Builder's Guide. The Real Estate Record and Builder's Guide, I want to get all my dates right on this. Again, this is, all that information is going to be on um, my sheet. Um, this started being published in 1868. Remember that in 1866, permits first started being published in New York City, or required rather. Um, it showed everything from conveyances, liens, mortgages, and permits in New York City and its environs, by the way. It even covers, like, at, for some years, it covers Westchester um, and Long Island. Um, uh, it was published, uh, the, the issues between 1868 mm -hmm. and 1923 are available online through Columbia University. Um, new buildings were indexed <coughs> at six month <coughs> intervals starting in 1878. Prior to 1878, you're going through weekly issues and it's painful. Um, have an intern do it. Um, <laughs> so, no, don't do that. Yeah. I do it. Um, so, but, they, but, uh, but when it's indexed, what happens is it will tell you on this street, you're going to see this many new building permits. So then you turn to those pages, and, and in some cases, because I had just a range of six years, it did not take me long to find the new building permit record, record, recorded here. So it shows numbers 244 to 250, um, East Houston Street East. So that they don't always put the East beforehand, they put it sometimes after. Uh, four or five story brick flats, 24.9 by 90 feet, tin roofs, cost $20,000 each. The owner was E.L. Winthrop, and the architect was um, uh, Julius Buckle and Son. Um, and um, so now I've got all the information that I was looking for that we weren't able to identify before. And while the building is kind of nondescript and not exciting right now, um, I, I find having that information uh, is invaluable. Um, so I'm going to take a little diverging because I just sort of toyed, teased you with the, um, with the 1940 tax photos. Uh, it was just this past fall that the New York City Municipal Archives finally released online in excellent resolution the 1940 tax photos. At the end of the 1930s, New York City had every single building pictured, uh, had a picture taken of every single building. And now all that is online. You used to have to go down to um, Municipal Archives and go through microfilm, and it was awful. Um, and you get horrible resolution copies of the unless you pay for it. But now you can, as you see back, here, these great pictures, and you can see the little uh, block and lot number right there. Um, the other wonderful resources for photographs um, are the Digital Archives of the Museum of the City of New York, also the New York Public Library. Um, if you have an Apple phone, there is an app um, called Urban Archive. It is a free app. It gives you a map. And if you have your locator services on, it will tell you all the historic photos right in your area, or you can touch the map and it takes you. What's great about this is it's one-stop shopping, because they have formed partnerships with us, with the Museum of City of New York, with the, with the New York Public Library, and so you, you're capturing all that information in one place. Um, they have told us for, I guess, two years now that they're going to expand to other types of devices, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, but there's other map formats as well. So NYPL also has um, old NYC where they have, um, where you can click on a point and it brings up all the photographs that it has in collection, associated in their collection associated with that point. I did it for Avenue A and 10th Street. 
and this is what came up, and this marvelous view is from 1934. Um, our collection also is quite good, and um, we have different collections in it. Um, people have graciously donated pictures that they've taken or that they had in their attics to us. Um, we also have created a map right here. Um, so you can collect, uh, uh, click on a point and see what we have in our collection as well. Um, and here's the, um, the website for getting those 1940s tax photos. As I said, there's also the 1980s tax photos, which they've had out for a while. The resolution on them is quite poor. You can order a better resolution from them, um, but uh, right now they're still not very good. Um, and what you can do is a simple search where it shows you right down here. You type in the block and lot number. Don't forget, New York City JIS gives us block and lot numbers if, you're, if you um, don't have that information. Um, and you can bring up, so I typed in the block and lot here, and I was able to bring up 539 11th Street, um, block 405, block 42. And look at the horse. And there's the guy, there's this guy with the hat who holds the sign all the time, and he's sometimes in the picture uh, with the block and lot. Um, but uh, when we do start to put this on our website, which is after we get through the Greenwich Village Historic District 50th anniversary, we're a little busy until then, yeah, sorry y'all. Um, this is the next goal for building blocks, is to link all those photos. And there's going to be a few mysteries solved as a result. Um, so here was another mystery. Again, a, a nondescript building um, that we weren't looking at too closely, unfortunately. And I decided that we would. Um, so um, the only thing that we, that we found on file was this ledger of alterations. And it says two buildings, five stories, non-fireproof, tenements. It talks about their size. 55 feet high, changed to one story. Height changed to 15 feet. It is proposed to remove the third, second, third, fourth, and fifth stories from the building and install a new roof, plumbing, blah, blah, blah. This was a very common thing that happened. It was choppy. I'll tell you why. Because um, the upper floors originally were intended for residential, typically, or were residential, and the first floor would be commercial. Um, for a landlord to meet uh, regulations as of 1901 for those residences became expensive. They also didn't always have people to rent to. So in order to uh, pay your taxes, you'd stick with the part of the building that still made you money, which was the commercial part. Um, this was a practice I found in Yonkers. Um, is, so it's very common that buildings just got chopped down and they were called taxpayers. Um, in the case of the one back here, by the way, see how it's two stories on this one? Um, that we found out later that this was added in 1990 through uh, modern permits. Um, so this is another resource, another good resource. This is the New York City Department of Buildings Building Information Search. Um, you can put in the uh, information right here for the building. You can also do it by block and lot. Um, and what pops up is this, and this is your property overview. You can get all the permits that have been, that have been filed since about the 1990s, about the late 1990s. Um, you can find out current things, violations, job filings. Um, there's all kinds of current information that you can get here. You can also frequently find old CFOs for some reason. I don't know why those made it and not old permits, but that's the case. But there's something called actions down here. And again, another mystery. And when you click on actions, it shows, old, it shows the evidence of old permits. And so, here's our 1937 permit right there. And it's indicated right there, but you can't click on it. We happen to have found that ledger that showed us what happened, um, but that's all you get. But sometimes this gives me information like, I see a new building permit. Maybe this wasn't what was carried through. I see demo permits. So it gives me an indication of what might be out there. Um, so here's the 1940 tax photo, and it shows me that that 1937 permit to chop off the upper floors was seemingly carried through. Both buildings are brought down to taxpayers. Look at the AP. Um, so now we've got to figure out, well, what was there originally? Um, so we turned to the tax records, and we found in 1870 that a gentleman named Alan Hay owned, uh, owned numbers, see street numbers right there, 39 and 35. So 30, I'm sorry, 37 and 35. 37 is uh, a little north of this, right? But 35 is our second building up. And in 1871, I know the resolution is hard on this, but that's just the tax records. There's nothing to do with that. 
For some reason, I don't know why, it shows 33, 35, 37, and now we have five-story tenements. Up here we had two stories and three stories, and the values have also changed. So it appears that, um, that these buildings were built between 1870 and 1871. And because these weren't indexed, I went through weekly issue after weekly issue. And I found, oh, so here's the 1862 map. I, I, I found it kind of curious that they only recorded two of the lots and they didn't record this one in 1870. And I don't know what the reason for that is. Sometimes it was recorded as, uh, as the cross street rather than on this, and it can switch in the year. You don't know. Um, but I wasn't going to get hung up on that. Um, also, by the way, look at that, Allen Hay Soap Company. So he owned all the, these lots as part of his soap co company factory in 1862. So, in 1870, I lucked out, I found this, Northwest Corner, 1st Avenue, 2nd Street, four five-story brick tenements, owner G. Rockman and Seeger. I don't know why that's different either, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. Architects are Clinkle and Cleanly, um, and the builder also appears to be the owner. So I don't know if he was building it and selling it back to Alan Hay. There was one time where I, um, I had a case where the, the tax records were showing a different owner than what I was seeing in the permit. And so I called the director of research at the municipal archives and I said, what do you think? Is it a mistake? I'm looking at the building. It absolutely lines up with what it's telling me. Um, so I think that this permit is correct. And his feeling was that the um, people who were doing the tax records were sort of like census takers. It's like, if you're there, you're there, I'm going to write it down, we're going to move on to the next building. They were trying to get through um, the, the uh, writing it down. Accuracy was not always prime um, in, their, in their purview. Uh, sometimes they would write down renters rather than the owners. Um, so his feeling was, was you sometimes you were better off with the real estate record of builder's guide as far as the owner was concerned. Uh, but here we were able to find this out. So now I got curious. So we got four. So then I looked on either side of these buildings, okay? And at 37 First Avenue, I have a building here that definitely could have been built in 1870. And this one over on 2nd Street, which butts up against the back of these two buildings. Um, and it said the corner. Four were built. And, um, and you see the style similarities between the two buildings. Um, so my feeling is, is that those two buildings originally looked like these. And these are the four that they were indicating in the, in the um, real estate record and builder's guide. Um, here's an example of a new law tenement, um, and the, the building that was, the permit that was on file was actually part of the ledger. Um, you saw that before with the alteration. This was actually a new building permit ledger, um, and that was what was on file. And so through that, we were able to see who the architect was and who the builder was. Uh, Charles B. Mayer, who was uh, a pretty prolific mayor, who was a pretty prolific architect, um, not just in the East Village but other places. Um, it goes into more information about the size of the building and comments. Uh, so this ends up being another um, great resource for us trying to identify that initial information. Um, and we didn't just stop in the you know early 20th century. We went all the way through. Um, here's the St. Mark at 115 East 9th Street. Um, and this uh, requires a little bit different research. So this, um, we looked at the 1955 map. 1955 map is a good benchmark when I'm looking at a mid-century building, obviously. Um, on the 1955 map, uh, we see that we still have, you know, tenementized row houses or early tenements right along Third Avenue there. Um, actually, I just, we just, um, the Harmony Bar and Restaurant used to be right there. We just had a blog about the film that was found of um, Jack Kerouac and um, Michael Ginsburg, I'm sorry, yeah. Alan Ginsburg um, uh, at the Harmony Bar. If you haven't seen it, it's a real hoot to watch. Um, but anyway, any so the building was not there in 1955. Um, so then I went back to the actions folder for um, in the Department of Buildings. And I see there's some new building permits going on here in 1961. I always caution myself, may not be the right one, we have to be sure. I also see some demo permits happening, though, in 1963. So that tells me some things are happening. There's another resource, um, Office of Metropolitan History. And the Office of Metropolitan History has all new building permits between, hold on, 1900 to 1986. So I took 
that new building permit number, which is 280 right there. Don't include the 61, the 1961 date here. And I found the information. Here's the architect. Um, here's the owner. 20-story apartment building. $3,500,000, year 1961. Um, I don't always hit it with this, um, but it's the best shot I've got for those buildings that are sort of, um, that I don't have permits for, that are before the modern permits that we see in EIS. Um, this is another resource. Columbia University has a collection of real estate brochures. They do not have every real estate brochure of sort of modern 20th century buildings. They do have it for the St. Mark. So when you when you got the St. Mark, it shows you everything, the address, um, neighborhood, architect, um, and then it shows you the brochure. Isn't that fabulous? Um, so this is built, this is uh, floors, the second floor through the 16th floor. They show you the floor plan, 17th floor, and then the penthouse. Um, they talk about how great it is to live here, and there's GE appliances, and um, all well and good. And do you even recognize Third Avenue in that picture? No. No. <laughs> um, so, that's, so that's how, uh, and that, that, was a, that was a good hit. We, again, we don't always have hits with these, but um, uh, um, keep looking, and more resources keep coming online. So then how do we research stuff that has been built recently? Um, my intern, uh, Louisa Winchell, who is an awesome research intern who loves to research. It's her favorite thing in the whole world. When I showed her that when you go onto Google Street View, you can change the year, she almost died. <laughs> she said, it was like, I, I, you know, I, Gen X showed Gen Z what to do. <laughs> and um, so here in 2007, we see an empty lot, and now we have this building. So. Um, so we need to look at our, at our um, BIS again, and now we're going to find modern permits that were filed. Um, so we bring up the building page, and we go to permits issued, um, and down here we see this 2019 all the way down to 1990, and where's our new building permit right here in 2008, so we click on it, and this brings up the new building permit. And don't forget that there's going to be lots of post-amendment approvals, so you have to like sort of make sure you get back to the right one and everything like that. But it gives you the architect, which was Isaac and Stern Architects. At the bottom, it gives you the owner. Um, so we're able to also capture that information, which someday will be historic. Um, so uh, when we first published the, um, the building blocks, there was a woman that stopped by, a lovely woman. Um, and I said, oh, she was asking about the East Village. And I said, well, have you looked at building blocks? She said, yes. I looked at my building, but she don't tell us anything. And I said, huh? And she said, well, I said, wasn't there the building date and the architect? And she said, well, yeah, but the people, who lived there? Who were the people? And I said, it's like when you made your favorite meal for your family, and they're like, ugh, chicken. Um, so uh, you know, just understand that this is an architecture and historic survey. However, at the bottom of each page is an opportunity for the public to make comments and tell their stories. And now this is going to take on another whole layer, and I invite you all to do that. We've already been getting wonderful stories. Some of them are a little seedy. Um, we've also been getting some great information that wasn't in the paper because there was so much countercultural stuff that didn't always make the books. Um, so I encourage you to look at that. We do always try and verify information where possible. Um, but you know, even the stories of my aunt Betty lived there, you know, those are all in there, and I think it's great information. So it's going to show you some other um, resources that uh, don't always come into play for me with this, um, but they're, they're, they're great research, resources nonetheless when you do research. Uh, one is the New York City directories um, from New York Public Library. These also just came online, and this also was another research yay moment. Um, they, these, these directories date back to, um, I skip pages, they date back to the uh, 1700s, and um, they take you to 1923 in Manhattan, and then there's one weird one in 1940. Um, I will say the ones in the 20th century, the resolution is not strong, unfortunately, uh, but the original on microfilm are at the Milstein building, Milstein room at the New York Public Library. I have also turned to those when I was doing the research for uh, the de Kooning studio over on Broadway. 
Uh, here I am with the old phone books looking up like a lady. You know? <laughs> uh, where was she living at the time? Um, through the phone book. Um, so I looked up the Stuyvesants in the 1814, 1850 um, directory because what else am I going to do? And we find Peter and he's living on Stuyvesant right here. He's listed as counselor, um, which means lawyer, of course. Uh, Nicholas William Stuyvesant, um, also living on Stuyvesant Street. John apparently was down on Mulberry. I guess he was the, um, the unlucky brother there. Um, but uh, they're a great resource. The only problem with these, on top, uh, in addition to the, the resolution gets, which gets really fuzzy in the early 20th, uh, early 20th century, is that they're not searchable. However, Happy Trust Digital Library has some issues of New York City Directory and Trows. Um, and they are searchable. And it's wonderful because I can do something like type in quotes, by the way, um, so it keeps it as a phrase, um, St. Mark. And I'm able, it listed all the people that were living on St. Mark. And the way that I know that they're listed, that they're living there is because H period is next to it. So what typically happens with these, uh, so just for instance, Josiah Carver, H30, 30 Dominic. So he's living, his home is at uh, 30 Dominic. For some reason, a, um, usually a profession is listed next to it too, but that didn't happen here. Here, what we're seeing, George Carville books, 176 East Broadway, that means that that's where he's selling books, but his home isn't listed. Um, Charles Carville, he's a commercial merchant, um, he at 17 Broad Street, and his home was at 12 St. Mark's Place. So this is a really fun thing to research. Uh, just real quick, back to New York Public Library. If you do have the name, obviously it's super easy to, to look up because it's alphabetical. Um, but this one, you know, for my purposes, being able to look at a street was really, uh, it's really helpful. Um, another search uh, is through the census records. This is its own lecture. Um, and uh, genealogical research, I encourage a class for that. And I know uh, libraries typically have them. But for me, what they do sometimes is they give me people who are, they give me that street address of, uh, uh, who's living in those streets as well. Um, so you have the 1870 census. The second enumeration was the first time they recorded New York City addresses. Not everybody knows that. There were two enumerations done in 1870, and the second one, they first recorded addresses. Um, 1880, the 1890 census was burned. It was an accident. Um, 1900, yeah, all that information was gone, is gone, and it was such a crucial year, if I could ever, like, go back in time, that's the one thing I'd fix, the only thing. Um, then, um, the 1900, 1910, 20, 30, and 40, it ends in 1940, because they're the 72 rule, 72 year rule on censuses, it has to be 72 years before they release it. There's also the New York State census records, those are on the five years. And all that uh, information is available through Ancestry. The problem with Ancestry is you can't do it by street. However, recently, there are these great uh, PhDs. Um, Stephen Morse, the Stephen Morse site is set up. Uh, this is definitely on your sheet. There's so much information on this. I mean, you can see they have the Ellis Island passenger list. They have, uh, they have, uh, uh, links so that it's easy to get census records in every single state. I and mean, this list goes way, 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 way down. Um, what, what this helps me with is it does the uh, enumeration districts for large cities. So what happens is um, I click on the enumeration district for large cities. I'm able to put in state, county, Manhattan. I put in the house number. I put in the street address. I show the cross streets. And it gives me the 1940 um, uh, enumeration <laughs> district right there. Um, I happen to have a link to Ancestry.com um, that, that does cost money. Uh, libraries typically have them for free. Um, but this site is incredible for getting people information for you know one building. Um, you can change the census year right up here. It does not have 1870 for New York because I talked to one of the guys who was doing this and he said, well, New York wasn't done with addresses in 1870, and I said, yes, it was. <laughs> you need to update your website. Um, but it is there. Uh, we actually found the um, census map for 1870, so we're able to figure out what the enumeration districts were for certain areas, and then you can scroll through a search on Ancestry. That gets a lot more complicated. Just call me, I'll do it for you. Um, so I did it for 232 East 11th Street, this search. 
and I was able to find the 1940 census. Um, of course, the, 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 pec the rector from St. Mark's Church was living there with his wife and son, um, and we're able to look at that census record right there. Um, other resources include uh, ACRIS. ACRIS shows you property and deeds back to 19 ACRIS, yeah, 1965. Um, before that, you have to go and do it in person. Um, there's also the Library of Congress, um, which is an incredible resource. Um, one of the things that has, that um, unfortunately wouldn't help us here in the East Village, but it's really fun to look at is, um, you know, for those of you that know, in the, um, during the Depression, one of the ways they hired engineers and architects uh, under the WPA program was doing the HAB survey, the Historic American Building Survey. Um, and there's, there's incredible drawings in there from that time of buildings, which still exist. Uh, there's some from over on uh, Charlton Street um, that are in the Library of Congress. They also have incredible collections of pictures. Um, so that's another great resource. And I made it in an hour. Yeah. <laughs>